Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Hydrogen in the Transport Sector and Infrastructure Planning webinar as part of our Hydrogen webinar series under the Clean Energy Solutions Center. We're just going to wait for everyone to join us. Um, give everybody a couple minutes. And as you're joining us, uh, it would be great to know where people are coming from. So if you have a minute, uh, we'd appreciate if you could put your name and your country and maybe uh, your organization in the chat, just to introduce yourself. Thanks. We'll get started in just a minute. For those that are joining, we're just gonna wait a couple minutes to let others join. I know we have folks from around the world coming in. So we would love it if you could int introduce yourselves in the chat so we could get a chance to know where you're coming from. Thanks very much. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started and I know a few other folks are going to trickle in. Again, if you can introduce yourself in the chat, that would be great. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to our sixth webinar in the webinar series, uh, the Hydrogen and Analytical Tools webinar series. This webinar is focused on hydrogen in the transport sector specifically, uh, as well as infrastructure planning. So we're really excited to, to share this webinar with you. I know we've, we've dived into a number of topics surrounding hydrogen markets, um, hydrogen and technologies and different tools that you can use for analysis of hydrogen projects. Um, and a few of those uh, we're going to recap in the last session, webinar seven, where we're going to bring everything together into uh, practical uh, applications and examples and case studies. But for today's webinar, as I mentioned, we're going to be deep diving into the topic of hydrogen for the transport sector. And we have some really exciting uh, presenters today to, to share with you. But before we do that, let's just kick off with uh, some house, housekeeping topics. So if we can go to the next slide. Thanks very much. All right, so first things first, I wanted to let everyone know this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so please let us know if, if you have any issues with that. The reason for that is that we're gonna be sharing this with you on our Clean Energy Solutions website. Um, so you'll have that as a reference and you can always watch it later on or share it with your colleagues. Um, we're automatically muting everybody upon entry, so um, nothing personal. We just want to make sure that we're able to hear all of our presenters well. Um, again, if you have any comments, please go ahead and feel free to add those in the chat uh, or, or any input you'd like to add to the discussion. But if you do have a question, there is another um, Q&A uh, area at the bottom, so you have both chat and Q&A. And if you can add your questions in the Q&A, that would be great. And we will address those at the end of each of the different speaker presentations. Um, if it's something that we can respond to directly in written format, we will go ahead and respond to that directly. Um, but most of the questions we'll save until the end. If you have any issues whatsoever, technical issues, please feel free to reach out directly to Sophie Schrader or Holly Darrow, and they'll be sure to, to help you fix that as soon as possible. You can also adjust your audio settings. Um, if you have any issues with connecting, you can dial in and listen on your phone. Uh, sometimes that works better for folks. Uh, we know that also a lot of you are joining from around the world. Uh, so thanks to you for, for those that are, are calling in from very late or very early hours. Much appreciated. Um, if you would like to have captions, we do have that function. Um, so you just have to select and the captions button at the bottom. It might show up as more dot, dot, dot. Um, you want to enable your translation in the captions option. And then you can say you can you can say what your speaking language is as well as your caption language. Um, please let us know if you have any issues with that. That's very important for those of you where English is not your first language. All of the presentations today will be in English. And then at the very end, we'll be launching a survey and we would greatly appreciate uh, if you could just take one minute at the end to give us your feedback on this webinar. So if there's any questions again, go ahead and put them in the Q&A or in the chat. We'll go ahead and Go to the next slide. So moving on with the webinar, next slide. 
Uh, today, we're going to be covering very briefly the Clean Energy Solutions Center, as always, just to give you a little bit of background on where this webinar series is coming from and how it's being funded. Um, and then we'll dive into our first presentation on the capacity for hydrogen to decarbonize the transport sector and ownership costs of different propulsion technologies for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, so that really diving into some very specific case studies and examples of how hydrogen is being used in the transport sector. Um, then we're gonna have a session on Q&A. Um, again, please put your questions in the Q&A. So we have a list of those questions by the time we get to the end of the presentations. Um, and then we'll dive into our second presentation where we have an overview of the Scenario Evaluation and Regionalization Analysis Model or SARA model. Um, as many of you that have participated, participated in previous webinars might have seen, we always try and integrate our national lab tools in the webinars so we can show practical applications and analysis tools that all of you have available that are open source and free tools. Um, and, and we will certainly put the link to those tools uh, in the chat for your reference. So really Really exciting webinar today. Um, again, please feel free to uh, interact, to share your questions. We always like this to be very interactive and dynamic. Um, so really looking forward to hearing what areas of, of hydrogen in the transport sector are most interesting for all of you. Next slide, please. So uh, with that, we'll pass it over to Jal Desai to give us an overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Thanks, Daniela. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you all for joining today's uh, webinar. Uh, so I'll give a quick overview uh, about Clean Energy Solutions Center. Next slide, please. So the Clean Energy Solutions Center is one of the work streams of the Clean Energy Ministerial. The objective of Solutions Center is to accelerate the transition of clean energy markets and technologies in developing and emerging economies. This initiative or this work stream is co-led by US and Australia and NREL is the operating agent. And along with this, we partner with more than, uh, we have 40 partners, including IDWINA, IEA and, and other uh, uh, MTPs. So basically we have three services that Solution Center offers. Uh, next slide, please. So the three, so three um, services that Solution Center offers are Ask an Expert, Training capa and Capacity Building and Resource Library. So let's talk about Ask an Expert. So Ask an Expert is considered the jewel of Solution Center. So if any entity working with the government or government at regional, national or local level, if they have any questions uh, on policy or regulatory, they can reach out to us uh, and we do this poll of uh, the expert matchmaking um, and we would do the technical assistance uh, um, for free. And we have almost 50 experts from around 15 countries and to date we have responded to 300 plus requests submitted by 90 plus government. Training and capacity building. Um, so we have delivered 300 webinars and trained more than 20,000 public and private stakeholders. We try to do one webinar uh, or two webinars every month on various topics. So if there are any interesting topics that you would like to hear, uh, please do send an email or put that in the chat. And then the third services that we offer is resource library. So we have more than 1500 curated reports, policy brief, journal articles on various technologies. Um, and it's available on the Clean Energy Solution Center website and we'll paste the link of the website in the chat. So uh, please feel free to explore. And again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to, uh, reach out to me or uh, through the email address that's on our, on our website. Um, and that is it. Back to you, Danny. Thanks, Cha. <clears throat> so without further ado, we'd like to introduce our three speakers today. Um, first off, we have Evan Reznicek, who's a hydrogen system analyst at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where he investigates technologies that can improve the sustainability of energy and transportation infrastructure. His focus is on emerging markets for hydrogen technologies, including medium and heavy duty transportation, grid energy storage, and industrial applications such as ammonia, steel making, and blending hydrogen into natural gas infrastructure. He's previously worked on design, simulation, and techno-economic analysis of thermal fluid energy systems, 
including solid oxide fuel cell systems and supercritical carbon dioxide power cycles. Evan has the bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Kansas and a master's and PhD in mechanical engineering from Colorado School of Mines. Next up, we have Dr. Alicia Berkey, a senior research engineer in the National Renewable Energy Laboratory Center for Integrated Mobility Science, serving on the commercial vehicle decarbonization team. Dr. Berkey specializes in techno-economic analysis and modeling of emerging freight technologies. She has 18 years of experience in analysis at the nexus of transportation, consumer behavior, energy, the environment, and the economy. She currently leads NREL's Fleet Red Eye Commercial Vehicle Data Collection and Analysis Project, as well as the development of techno-economic tools, including T3CO, Titan, and HD Adopt. She also supports the development of NREL's new national intermodal freight model, Informes, recently funded by ARPA-E. Prior to joining the energy field, she worked as a structural dynamics and system engineer, supporting NASA Earth System Science missions. Alicia holds a PhD in policy studies and a bachelor's in aerospace engineering from the University of Maryland, College Park. And then last up, we have Justin Bracci, who earned his bachelor's degree at the State University of New York at Buffalo in 2019, majoring in environmental engineering and minoring in geology. He then attended Stanford University and received a master's degree in energy resources engineering in 2021. During his time at Stanford, he conducted research on hydrogen energy system techno-economics and life cycle emissions, with a specific focus on heavy-duty trucking applications in California. Now, Justin works as a hydrogen systems infrastructure analyst at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where he continues research on hydrogen techno-economics and infrastructure planning. He grew up in Buffalo, New York, and much of his family still lives in Western New York. Justin is, is an avid Buffalo sports fan and enjoys playing golf and soccer in his free time. He also likes to travel and has good, a goal to watch baseball game in every major league baseball stadium. With that, we'll go ahead and get started on our first presentation. Over to you, Evan. Thanks very much. Thanks, Daniela. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, I guess we can go ahead and skip to the next slide. So I wanted to start this presentation by talking a bit about NREL's high level vision for decarbonizing the transportation sector. Um, we, you know, we kind of see these different, um, sorry, you can go back a slide. Um, we kind of see, you know, several different transportation sectors um, and several different energy carriers that can service those. And rather than prescribing a kind of one size fits all solution, we see these different energy carriers as potentially being able to serve or complement each other in serving these different transportation sectors. And so, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of projections about decarbonization center around uh, clean electricity as a starting point. And that can obviously be used either to directly charge battery electric vehicles or can be used to produce hydrogen via electrolysis, which can then be used to fuel um, vehicles or rail applications or marine. Uh, and then, of course, liquid fuels are also likely going to play a role in some of these applications as well. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of people are kind of familiar with, at least at a high level, some of the trade-offs between these different uh, energy carriers. Um, so, you know, obviously a great benefit of electricity is that you can use it to directly charge, um, you know, vehicles that rely on batteries for energy storage. Um, but as you move towards hydrogen and liquid fuels, you increase the energy density of those um, applications or of those storage media. And you can also, to some degree, decouple the production of that energy from the consumption of it without necessarily needing to rely on, on battery chemistries. Um, and so this is kind of how we see these different, different energy carriers potentially serving different sectors, um, you know, with hydrogen kind of focused on medium and heavy duty trucking, potentially rail um, and or marine applications. And most of this presentation is going to focus specifically on medium and heavy duty transport um, because that's kind of an area where we've been funded to do a lot of research recently. Uh, and we think it's, it's one area where hydrogen has a good potential for decarbonization. If we skip to the next slide. So, and a lot of this presentation is going to be focused on the US. Uh, you know, we're 
a national lab funded by the Department of Energy. And so um, we tend to end up focusing a lot of our analyses on the US. But if we look at US greenhouse gas emissions, roughly a third of those are associated with transportation. Um, about half of that is passenger cars and, and light trucks. But then 20% of it is medium and heavy duty vehicles, including everything from parcel delivery trucks, uh, drayage vehicles, um, you know, buses, large semis and tractors, refuse trucks, et cetera. So roughly 21% of that. So, you know, a fifth of a third is is roughly a 15th, but that's still a fairly significant amount of, um, you know, overall emissions. And so it's going to be really important to address that if we want to reach our goal of of minimizing or eliminating emissions by 2050. Now, if we look at the medium and heavy duty market, um, it, we've got roughly 11 million vehicles in the US and those are fairly evenly distributed across different uh, medium and heavy duty classes. So class three and four smaller vehicles up through class seven and eight vocational vehicles and tractors. However, the uh, total vehicle miles traveled per year as well as uh, fuel consumption and emissions are not nearly as evenly distributed. And so, for example, class seven and eight vehicles are roughly 40% of, of overall vehicle stock, but they account for roughly 78% of energy emissions. And then class seven and eight tractors, um, those represent 25% of vehicles, but 67% of energy and emissions. Uh, and these long haul applications tend to be where hydrogen has some strengths relative to other options. Um, and so as I think a lot of the, the slides in this presentation will show, you know, that's kind of a key area where we see hydrogen contributing to decarbonizing the transportation sector. So if we go to the next slide, um, I just wanna briefly highlight a few DOE funded hydrogen projects related to transportation that we have here at NREL. So one of these is the California Hydrogen Infrastructure Research Consortium, which is a part of the H2S scale program. And that project focuses on data collection from actual operating stations, uh, capturing things like component failure, fixed verifications, um, new and new fueling methods for medium and heavy duty vehicle applications. There's the heavy duty hydrogen fueling station corridors project, which Justin is gonna talk about in a bit, that focuses on assessing the ra ranges of levelized cost of dispensed hydrogen at hydrogen refueling stations to support the development of hydrogen fueling corridors in the United States. Uh, there's another project that is focused on assessing heavy duty fueling methods and components. So this is a, this is a creative research and development agreement project with a number of industry partners that are active in the uh, hydrogen refueling and heavy duty vehicle space. And it focuses on supporting, providing key supporting information to them for selecting and implementing heavy duty fueling protocols, um, as well as testing new heavy duty fueling components using those protocols at NREL's heavy duty refueling station. And then there's one other project called the Hydrogen Component Reliability Data Set Database or HiCred, which is a platform for developing a common database for hydrogen component failures and failure rates. And then if we go to the next slide, I will pass it off to Alicia. Thanks, Evan. Um, so uh, thinking a little bit more broadly about what's going on in the uh, hydrogen space um, with the Department of Energy, and this isn't comprehensive of all the projects that we have, but looking specifically at what we call the Super Truck 3 project, um, and I want to put this in context, the first Super Truck project was uh, instituted around 2011, um, and that project focused entirely on long haul trucks and um, it had two goals. One was to improve their freight of operational efficiency, and the other one was to demonstrate uh, uh, a brake thermal efficiency on an engine of 55%. And um, because of that kind of focus back in, you know, it's only been about 10 years ago, we were only looking at diesel vehicles. Um, there was some mild hybridization in those projects, but none of them were looking at battery electric or fuel cell vehicles. Now we fast forward to Super Truck 3, where the scope was opened up and we started thinking we needed to push zero emission vehicles. And we ended up with four out of the five funded projects involving hydrogen uh, vehicles. And so I just wanted to highlight some of those use cases that, that are being looked at. Um, 
class eight truck uh, trucks were in, in several of them for the obvious reason that, that uh, Evan has already mentioned. You know, they're very high energy uh, requirement, which makes it much more difficult to use a battery electric vehicle. But there's also in these um, a, a two uh, medium duty trucking projects. One of them is a classic super duty truck um, with the Ford Motor Company, which NRL is supporting. And the other one is kind of more general class four through six trucks. And I think they're, I think they're looking mostly at freight movement. Um, but I think the interesting thing in the Ford uh, project that we're working on that is it's looking at, at kind of at service vehicles where even though on average, they may not be traveling uh, a lot, a long distance on average every day, but they have days when they do need to have um, this longer range of operation uh, and which which gives them higher energy needs. Plus, they do have uh, PTO demands for doing on uh, the job site work, um, and they're serving critical needs. And so, the, you couldn't necessarily uh, use a battery electric vehicle that um, can meet this average uh, duty cycle and still meet what they kind of see the variety of what they see um, over the course of a year, including something like if it were a, a utility truck. Um, that needs to uh, go to support, you know, maybe it's up in the Midwest, but there's been a hurricane down in Florida. They will travel uh, all the way from, you know, from their home base down to Florida to help out because the, because the need is so high. Um, and so what they're looking to do is provide something that is um, more on a par with a diesel or gasoline vehicle in terms of the energy onboard storage and uh, the refueling time. And um, so just to, to highlight what NREL's role on this is, uh, we are providing operational data analysis as well as an analysis of the total cost of ownership um, and the emissions. Uh, and then we're also doing a broader market assessment to understand um, how, how that kind of applies more broadly. Um, and I, I do want to point out that they, that NREL has several other projects uh, with with um, hydrogen, which I did not uh, include on on the slides as well, but some demonstration projects for drayage uh, trucks as well. Uh, next slide. So a quick highlight of some of the tools that we have for market assessment uh, at both technology and uh, market assessment in the transportation space. And several of these, I'll highlight some of the uh, capabilities and results that we're seeing. Uh, the first one is our T3C, our Transportation Technology Total Cost of Ownership tool. And that's the one that operates at the kind of the most detailed level, can really capture um, the operational specifics for a vehicle and, and look at the full life cycle costs um, going beyond just the purchase and the fuel. Um, and it is fully integrated with our simulation tool, FastSim, so that we can actually look at either, you know, standard duty cycles. But we can also look at real-world data and see what how, how the vehicle is going to perform in terms of uh, fuel economy and cost. Um, the second one is Titan, which actually integrates T3CO with a cost-based uh, market adoption model and then a stock turnover, which allows us to go from a very specific uh, set of, uh, say, component-level targets all the way up to um, the impact of that on the national scale um, with some generalization in between. And the second uh, similar model we have is called ADOPT, and, and we have rather uh, recently developed a heavy-duty version of ADOPT, which um, is looking specifically at the tractor market and it in a similar to Titan it's fully integrated uh, technology evolution market adoption stock modeling it has fast and embedded um, and it in endogenously evolves the technology to meet market demand uh, in terms of uh, it optimizes the market shares um, and we recently uh, modified this version to be capable of doing some more specific analysis for hydrogen, looking at uh, different hydrogen storage, uh, onboard storage technologies, and also adding in uh, hydrogen combustion and also uh, a hybrid uh, engine or a dual fuel engine that can uh, burn both hydrogen and diesel. So some, some some new technologies that are you know being actually looked at within industry. And that develop model development was actually performed uh, for Shell, and it is of the version that we developed is actually for the European Union. Um, but those capabilities can be applied to um, the U.S. market as well. Um, and then the next model uh, system we have is called Tempo our transportation energy and mobility pathway options model, which uh, is, is a larger scale national model uh, looking at all of the different transportation modes simultaneously. So it's light duty, medium and heavy duty, um, off-road and um, kind of a non-road. So it includes rail and uh, I think 
uh, I'm not sure about cargo handling, but it definitely has uh, rail, marine, and aviation. Um, and then the last one, Altrios, is a specific deep dive into rail technology. I mentioned that I don't have any results here for today, but I mentioned it because it is capable of looking at uh, fuel, hydrogen fuel cell, specifically for freight rail. Um, and it is a, a simulation uh, uh, tool, but it, it, it actually can operate at both at the powertrain level, but then also look at rollout strategies for decarbonization. Next slide. So starting kind of at the more, most specific, we have uh, our T3CO model. Um, and, and why is TCO important? Uh, the, the bottom line is commercial vehicles are tools. They're not, you know, they're not for fun. They're not, uh, they absolutely have to do the job that they need to do and they need to do it in a cost-effective manner. So adoption of new technologies really is driven by, first by meeting the functional requirements and be doing so reliably. But then after that, it really is cost-driven. Um, and because of that, um, we find that TCO is a critical metric for mass adoption. But at the same time, we recognize that medium and heavy duty commercial vehicles have a, there's a diverse set of vocations and each one of those vocations has very specific performance and economic requirements. And T3CO is able to take in those specific requirements and specific vehicle configuration and take a look at the total cost of ownership over time. Um, and the most, uh, the other interesting thing I want to point out is that while energy is certainly the second largest cost for um, operational cost uh, after labor, um, some of the things that we hear from industry that were really critical to capture is the, uh, the value of uh, the payload capacity that could be reduced because of heavy batteries or um, could even be the volume of, of fuel storage or energy storage. Um, and, but also then the downtime that might be required to charge those vehicles if they can't meet the demands of the day. So um, if they need to stop and charge in the middle of the day, um, we heard that that was a really important thing to capture. And so I just, I have an example thrown on here of, of if you looked at a regional class A day cab um, in, in it, was designed for 300 miles um, on a specific cycle, but then you apply it to kind of a real world day and we find that it can't meet the day's um, needs. And so you'll see if we, we compare the battery electric vehicle to the fuel cell, um, that uh, because of those, the, you'll notice the red bands on top are the fueling dwell time and the, the opportunity, the lost opportunity of operating uh, because it had to stop in charge. Um, and so in this particular example, we can see that um, that's, that provides, uh, even though the vehicle was less expensive uh, to purchase and then to operate in terms of fuel, when we add on those, uh, those other additional costs, we find that it is um, not as cost effective. Uh, next slide. So why is you know this cost of ownership important, and how do we apply that to looking at what's going to happen in the market? Um, again, um, those decisions are based on economics, and so um, in the case of our adoption models, we're currently working with what we're going to call the total cost of driving instead of the total cost of ownership, which is a, a smaller set of the cost elements, um, but it considers the upfront cost, uh, fuel cost, maintenance costs, which we know we expect will vary uh, among powertrains. Um, with diesel vehicles becoming more and more expensive to maintain because of emission regulations. Um, and then also looking at that opportunity cost for charging downtime. Um, and what we, uh, when we look at that, uh, those costs over time, we find that even though advanced technologies more be, may be more expensive to purchase, um, that the fuel that the fuel cost can be reduced or the other operating costs can be reduced over time uh, that those savings can pay back that initial upfront cost and so that's that's kind of the fundamental basis of the way we look at the uh, the adoption of these vehicles we expect that once they break even um, and then start to actually pay a dividend um, that they become attractive to purchase and that kind of that break even uh, period is kind of the critical metric for when it is that we think that the vehicle will start to be adopted and, and, and how many of them would be adopted. Uh, consumers have different uh, preferences for those payback periods, um, but we generally hear it's anywhere from, uh, you know, if it pays back within two years, two to three years, um, and then pro provides those dividends after that, that we're going to start seeing adoption. Um, I think that's probably all I need to highlight on this slide. If you want to go to the next slide, then we can um, start thinking about what does that look like when we put it into practice in some of our models. Um, so the Tempo model um, it, it has done a, an exploration of the medium and duty space, um, making some assumptions about how technology will evolve and what future fuel prices 
uh, well, fuel and energy prices are going to, to look like. Um, and if we assume some of the, uh, that uh, many of the technology targets that DOE is working toward are going to be met in the future, um, that we do see that the, the zero emission vehicles can reach uh, uh, parity with diesel and begin being ad ad adopted uh, is early as 2035 and generally across most of um, the use cases that we look at. Keeping in mind that uh, when we look at the market adoption, we're typically uh, kind of lumping together our, our vehicle classes so we don't get some of the specificity of some of the very unique use cases. But in general, um, depending on those uh, relative energy prices, we do see this expectation of, of parity relatively soon uh, across the board. Um, You'll notice that uh, on the lower right quadrant, that's the specific application where we're the most challenged, and that's our, our tractors that are traveling uh, long range. And so um, there's a little bit more uh, uncertainty depending on what the cost of hydrogen is and the cost of electricity for charging will be in, in terms of whether or not we're gonna see, um, when we're gonna see that parity occur. Um, but, and that's also where we believe that fuel cell vehicles then can become competitive uh, because of their energy density and their ability to refill much more quickly. Um, but the other thing that's important probably to highlight um, is that even if we were able to actually transition all of our sales to 100% zero emission vehicles by 2035, um, because of the way the stock turns over, uh, some of these vehicles have very long lives. Even, even so, by 2050, we would still see at least 25% of the stock on the road is a legacy diesel vehicle or gasoline vehicle, um, in which case we also need to be thinking about uh, drop-in fuels that could be, um, could be used in those vehicles. Um, so in, in this particular slide, I think just to highlight some of the, uh, the assumptions, uh, diesel price is pretty much on a par with what it's been historically in the U.S., which is about uh, three and a quarter to four dollars per gallon. Um, and you can kind of see where the break even points occur um, with electricity and hydrogen costs and highlighting that uh, hydrogen really needs to be um, at or below five dollars per gallon. To, or per kilogram, which is similar to a gallon of, of uh, gasoline, um, to, to be cost effective and competitive. Um, next slide. And so uh, what happens though in the United States, uh, we currently have a set of um, incentives which accelerate basically by reducing that upfront cost can accelerate the adoption of those vehicles by moving the parity point much earlier. Um, and with this analysis, we're seeing that, you know, what was looking like 2035 can be accelerated up to as early as 2028, assuming the technology could be uh, in the market by then. Um, and what then becomes really important, of course, is getting the, the, the infrastructure out there in time to meet the demand that we think would be there. Um, and obviously, there are smaller vehicles and our shorter haul vehicles are the ones that are going to see that parity occur first. Um, and, and again, fuel cells still play a role in those more uh, higher energy challenging applications, but still requiring that energy price to be fairly low. And that's actually something that um, our incentives are, are working toward as well, um, not just vehicle purchase incentives, but also incentive towards uh, production of hydrogen to bring that price down. Uh, next slide. So if we look at um, our Titan modeling results, which we also did in exploration across um, a, a range of uh, energy prices and technology progress in the future, and, and our Titan modeling framework is a little bit more conservative on the adoption uh, assumptions, um, but I think we can still highlight uh, you know, the, the importance here of of both the technology advancement and the vehicle prices. So the technology advancement basically brings down the cost and the energy density, or increases the energy density of, of the uh, energy storage, uh, brings down the cost of the, the storage as well as the, the motors and the fuel cell stacks, and um, 
and plays a significant role. And so just to show a few of the, of the uh, scenarios that we ran, um, kind of if everything occurred according to business as usual in terms of energy prices and, and technology advanced at a relatively slow rate, we would find that we really don't have much happening in the way of electrification um, until after 2042, and we don't see much happening at all in the way of hydrogen. Um, but it, when we uh, advance the technology along the lines of DOE's targets, we, we accelerate that significantly, um, and we end up with uh, uh, quite a bit of battery uh, electric uh, adoption, primarily, again, in the smaller and shorter range vehicles. But the hydrogen then comes on about the time that we get the price of the hydrogen down to $5 per gallon or per kilogram. So it's, again, that's that's kind of why we have that bogey. We understand that that's what makes it competitive. Um, but finally then, if you can also drop the price of the electricity um, low enough and get the infrastructure out there so they don't you don't incur those uh, en route charging penalties, that's when we really get a significant adoption of our zero emissions uh, vehicles. And what we found in this particular analysis is that there's a significant tipping point around 18 cents per kilowatt hour for, for our electric battery electric vehicles. When it's lower than that, we get really great adoption. When it gets above that, we start to have, have issues in um, some of our uh, adoption rates. Um, next slide. And so we also did some exploration on you know, what happens if, if the battery electric uh, either charging infrastructure doesn't roll out the way we, we really want it to, or if um, the electricity price doesn't, you know, because of the requirements for infrastructure installation um, if, or demand charges, if, they rem if that price ends up being relatively high for fleets to um, do their on route charging, um, then that's when we see that hydrogen could play you know the larger role and and so um what we have here some alternative highs of adoption cases where we did see uh, hydrogen pay, playing that more significant roles particularly with again our tractors um and uh, and those cases were um uh we found that fuel cells could be more competitive when oil prices are high um and our technology progresses quickly if the charging uh costs are higher than 18 cents per kilowatt hour. And um, if we didn't have significant uh, capabilities for charging en route and need, and so we needed a quick fill um, and instead with hydrogen work better. Um, next slide. And I think here I'm, I'm handing it back over to either Evan or Justin. Thanks Alicia, yep, I'll take this one. Um, so I'm going to switch focus a little bit here and more go into um, what costs we're seeing uh, for dispensed hydrogen, looking at heavy duty uh, refueling stations to support uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. I'm going to focus more on the U.S. analysis and hydrogen fueling corridors in the U.S. Um, and Evan touched on this work um, briefly before. So we recently published an NREL techni technical report where we were looking at the technomic economics um, for hydrogen refueling stations and looking at pathways to deliver hydrogen uh, to those refueling stations. Um, for this work, the primary tool that we leveraged was HD-SAM, or the Hydrogen Delivery Scenario Analysis Model. Uh, that's an Argonne National Lab tool that lets you look at different delivery pathways uh, for hydrogen from production to refueling stations and um, see how those costs compare for those different uh, delivery configurations and refueling station configurations and how that changes over time. Um, and so the goal of this report was to identify what the levelized cost um, would be for dispense, dispensing hydrogen at refueling stations um, and how um, you know that would vary depending on the station configuration and delivery uh, pathway. Um, we looked at two uh, refueling station and delivery pathways primarily, um, one being a liquid hydrogen delivery pathway where you have the hydrogen delivered via a liquid tanker truck. Um, then that liquid hydrogen is put um, into cryogenic storage and then goes through a pump and evaporator system into high pressure buffer storage before being, being dispensed into a heavy duty uh, truck at 700 bar. Uh, the other pathway that we looked at was an on-site production uh, refueling station case where 
uh, after hydrogen is produced on site, it will be piped uh, to the refueling station um, where, you know, the gaseous hydrogen will be compressed into uh, buffer storage and then dispensed into the vehicle at 700 bar. Um, and I'll go on to the next slide. And so for this work, we looked at a number of uh, different key, key parameters that went into the HD SAM model. Primarily, these parameters are pulled from uh, past and current ongoing work at the Department of Energy and National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, so for the fill rate of the heavy duty trucks, we looked at five kilograms uh, a minute, which is fairly conservative estimate. Um, you know, we were looking at heavy duty trucks that, you know, are about 50, 60 kilograms for they have for onboard hydrogen storage. So we looked at around 50 kilograms of dispensing per truck, um, you know, state of charge of refueling. We wanted to be around 15 to 25 percent um, when they're going to uh, refuel. Um, other key parameters on, on the delivery side, we looked at uh, production cost, um, so upstream uh, production costs of $1.50, which is basically a, a median cost um, for uh, the predominant form of hydrogen production today. And then we you know, made some assumptions about uh, liquefier sizing for the liquid hydrogen delivery pathway and, and some baseline delivery distance um, and, and piping for the on-site case. Next slide, please. Um, looking uh, deeper at the liquid uh, hydrogen delivery pathway via tanker truck, via tanker truck, there's two important considerations um, when looking at the dispense costs at a refueling station that's supplied with liquid hydrogen. Um, one uh, key consideration is how far that delivery distance is uh, for the liquid hydrogen. And on the figure on the left, we're looking at the levelized cost of transport and how that varies as the round trip delivery distance uh, to the refueling station and back to the terminal, how that uh, changes and how that impacts the levelized cost of transport. And actually what you see is you go from 10 kilometer round trip delivery distance to 200 kilometer, there really isn't that big of a dif difference in the levelized cost It only shows up to be roughly eight cents. And so, you know, delivery distance isn't that uh, too much of a concern um, for liquid hydrogen delivery uh, pathways. Um, what's more, uh, what has more of an impact on the levelized cost is when you look on the figure on the right, it's the, the liquefaction and terminal size. And so what you're seeing in this figure is the levelized cost of liquefaction and, and terminal and the terminal and how that changes as the size of those facilities increase from five metric tons per day um, to 5,000 metric tons per day. And you can see if, you know, if you have a very small terminal and liquefaction facility, you know, you're getting you know, over $6 per kilogram US dollars, and that can drop, you know, over 50% if you can really take advantage of economies of scale and get up to, you know, 500 or 1,000 metric ton per day facility sizes. Um, today, most uh, liquefaction terminals are about 50 tons per day. So for our results, we focused on that 50 ton per day uh, number. Next slide, please. I'll just brush on this slide quickly. This is just going into more detail at the refueling stations, both the on-site uh, gaseous hydrogen dispensing one and the liquid hydrogen supplied station. It just gets into more detail of the components that are, um, you know, taken into consideration or in that basically the infrastructure components that are there at the refueling station. Um, main points is that, you know, storage and compressors are typically um, the highest um, uh, direct cost for um, these components. And, you know, the storage size and number of compressors is going to be dependent on, you know, your typical operating profile for the refueling station um, and how, how reliable um, your supply is and, and how much, you know, uh, um, you know, backup hydrogen you want to have on site of the refueling station. Um, next slide, please. And we can actually skip over this one. These are the same sort of results, um, just looking at a different size refueling station, 18 ton instead of four ton per day. And then last slide for me, these are this is our uh, key result from uh, key results slide from the report um, where we're showing the potential levelized cost of dispensed hydrogen under a number of different conditions. So. I'll focus first on the figure on the left where we're looking at the levelized cost of dispensed hydrogen. So taking into account everything from producing hydrogen to delivering hydrogen to their fueling station costs. 
and getting a dollar per kilogram estimate. Um, and so on the uh, x-axis here on the left figure, what you see is uh, sort of two sensitivities that we considered. Um, one, we considered different refueling station sizes. So four, eight, and 18 metric ton per day refueling stations that have some economies of scale as you get to larger refueling stations. And then also we considered different uh, station utilization rates. And by, and by that, we mean basically the percentage of uh, hydrogen, of basically the maximum. Uh, per, so I guess, let me give an example. So like a four metric ton refueling station, a 50% utilization would mean that you're only going to be using two tons of hydrogen per day. Um, so basically 50% um, capacity factor or, or utilization rate. And what you see is that um, as you increase the utilization rate, your levelized co cost um, starts to drop because you're, um, you know, taking advantage of more of the infrastructure and not letting it sit um, um, and being unused. Um, when we look at the figure on the right, um, which is the on-site uh, production case um, in a gaseous dispensing, you actually see that there's, you know, a bigger change in the levelized cost to dispense hydrogen based on the utilization rate. So, you know, the utilization rate, as that goes up, you see a big drop in the levelized costs. And the, the reason why it drops more significantly for the on-site production case versus the liquid delivery case is due to the um, amount of infrastructure that's centered at the refueling station. So the on-site production case, you have more cost. Um, the, the refueling station is a higher cost component. You have more storage um, and you have high cost compressors in the on-site uh, gaseous dispensing case. Um, and when you have, you know, higher costs at the refueling station, you're not utilizing that as much. You know, your, your costs tend to go up if the utilization rate's low. Um, when you look at the liquid delivery pathway, a lot of the costs are focused upstream. So in, in liquefaction and production, and that doesn't change um, if you if the refueling station utilization rate changes. And so you don't see as much variation in that uh, in in that liquid delivery case when you look at changing utilization rate. Um, and with that, I think I'll pass it back to Evan for the quick summary. Yep. Thanks, Justin. Um, so yeah, to recap, uh, reducing commercial vehicle carbon emissions is going to be critical for achieving um, emission mitigation goals. And uh, however, meet the medium and heavy duty vehicle market is highly diverse. And identifying cost-effective solutions means looking at different potential, uh, different potential technologies for different applications. Um, zero emission vehicle adoption in medium and heavy duty vehicles is going to be driven by economics, where vehicle and energy or fuel prices, along with infrastructure availability, are are very key um, for the advancement of these these technologies, and. Um, you know, the assumptions we make around those things have very significant ramifications for, you know, if, when, and to what extent we see uh, different technologies like hydrogen um, penetrating the market. Uh, regardless, we do feel pretty confident that hydrogen dispense costs really need to be reduced to less than $5 per kilogram to achieve significant market penetration. Uh, and this could potentially be achieved with adequate technological progression and with deployment at scale of both vehicles and refueling infrastructure. Um, and with that, I think we're finished with the presentation and we can turn it back uh, over to you guys for questions. Thanks so much. Really, really interesting. I know a lot of information, uh, very technical. So I just want to make sure that that was clear to everybody. If there were any particular areas that you would like a bit more clarification on um, and obviously any questions that you have. So it looks like we have one initial question. Uh, is there any way to compare the cost of transportation by vehicle vehicles and pipelines? And maybe Julian, I don't know if you want to elaborate a bit on that question. Feel free as well. Maybe just to ask, and maybe if you can add a bit more details in your question. Um, when you're talking about types of transportation, you say, is there any way to compare the the cost of transportation are you talking about between different types of transport when you're considering vehicles and pipelines um, or, tra or uh, trans transport uh, distribution delivery infrastructure? Are you kind of asking about all of all of those types of infrastructure included? 
I think on my side, it might be looking at comparing transporting hydrogen, like using a truck and transporting it versus using a pipeline. Um, okay. I think that's how I'm reading it. And so we didn't do that in uh, that study that I was uh, showing. So we just did a liquid delivery versus, um, you know, on site. Um, but with the HD SAM tool that's from Argonne National Lab, you can look at um, pipeline transport, and you can do gaseous uh, to trailer transport as well. So you can compare those. We ended up focusing on on liquid because um, we saw that as being more economic. Um, once the station sizes get larger, um, than gaseous tube trailers, um, pipeline. You know there is some uh, potential for pipeline in the future, but we're thinking that might be a little bit further out into the future. And we wanted to focus our analysis um, sort of at these initial stages in the next um, five, 10 years, what the what, what we see is most likely. So that, that was sort of why we focused on the on-site and, and liquid delivery pathways. Hopefully, hopefully that uh, answered it. Jillian, did you wanna add any additional questions on that? It is a really important question. Um, and obviously the cost of transportation can the cost of delivery of, of delivery of hydrogen significantly. And so that is one of the, the main motivations for trying to find local users, um, hydrogen hubs, uh, the big opportunity there where you can reduce the transport costs of, of hydrogen. Um, but certainly if you have any additional questions on that or clarifications, please add them in, in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay. I don't see any other questions. I'll give everybody another minute just in case. Again, I know it was it was a lot of technical information. So if you would like uh, any of our speakers to go back and, and kind of revisit any of the slides, please let us know um, if you'd like them to elaborate on any of the information presented. And I do see a question here. Are we going to be sharing the presentation? So this webinar will be shared. Um, the recording of the webinar will be shared on the Clean Energy Solutions Center website. OK. If there are another, no other questions, and obviously feel free to add your questions and we can go back and, and respond to them later, um, then I think we're going to shift over to the presentation on the SARA tool. So I believe that's going to be you, Justin, as well. If yep, we want to go ahead correct. and share the slides again. Sure. Okay, can you see the slides? Okay. Yep, looks good. Okay, let's see if I can move this over here. Okay, C cool, perfect. Um, so yeah, we're gonna transition sort of the next uh, webinar now. Um, so you, you have me again for, for this presentation. Um, but yeah, so I'll be focusing on a specific uh, model modeling tool we have here at the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is called the Scenario Evaluation and regionalization analysis model. Um, it's a hydrogen techno-economic tool, and it is sort of an infrastructure planning tool and planning, you know, sort of least cost pathways to build out uh, hydrogen infrastructure to support demand. Um, so in this uh, presentation or in this webinar, I'll go over, you know, four sections. I'll do an overview of the SARA model. Um, I'll go over a, a case study where we use a SARA model, and then I'll touch on sort of the importance of SARA and some of its uh, limitations and, and ways to work around the, the, these limitations. And so, yeah, I'll start with the, the overview. You know, what does this uh, SARA model do? Um, and so, you know, I'll start with the question, what is SARA? So it's the Scenario Evaluation Regionalization Analysis Model. Um, and what it does is it um, you provide the model a number of hydrogen demands. Um, you provide it feedstock and utility prices, and you provide it uh, technology costs, hydrogen technology costs that are both production technology, storage technology, st transmission, distribution, um, and refueling station and other end-use technologies. You provide costs on that data or costs on that uh, on those technologies. And what Sarah will do is it will optimize um, a user-defined uh, network um, both in space and in time and do it in the least cost manner to um, to supply hydrogen from the production nodes to the refueling station nodes. Um, 
or other end use nodes. And so, you know, it might be blurry, but I'm going to run through a bunch of examples here on how it works. And hopefully by the end, it'll get it get a lot clearer. Um, another thing I want to note on Sarah is that, you know, this model was built, I think, over 10 years ago now and was originally written in uh, Haskell programming language, which I hadn't heard of until I started working on the Sarah model, actually, because it's not used uh, very much today. Um, over the last two, three years, it has been converted to Julia programming software, and we've made a number of uh, developments over the last couple of years. And so when you see Sarah 2.0, 2.0 is referring to, you know, the transfer over to Julie in the, in the recent updates that we've made to, uh, to the model. So uh, getting into the objective function of this optimization model, it is a linear objective, uh, linear optimization that employs uh, heuristics to uh, take into, into consideration the uh, basically nonlinearity of, of economies of scale. And so the objective function is split up into four parts. So the first part is a uh, demand benefit. So what's interesting is over the last year or two is, you know, Sarah used to just minimize over costs, but now um, we've added a capability where it can maximize social welfare um, by taking into consideration demand curves. And so, you know, this first piece of the ob objective function is, is demand benefit, which is the area under the demand curve, which um, takes into account the price of, of the demand of the demand segment or at the demand node and the quantity of demand that is supplied at that node. And so you subtract from that uh, demand benefit the investment cost. So these are, you know, your capital costs for production technologies, delivery technologies, uh, storage technologies, end use, end use technologies. And then you also subtract the fixed costs, which are, you know, annual costs. Um, and then they're based on, you know, the percent, uh, basically, you know, percent per year of the capital costs. And then finally, you subtract out the operating costs from the objective function. This takes into account variable operating costs, uh, feedstock costs such as electricity, natural gas, and other material costs such as uh, such as water or, or oxygen or other other materials that are um, inputs um, to to any of the technologies that Sarah includes in the model. Um, and so, what does Sarah 2.0 answer today? Um, at the highest level, what Sarah answers is where should we build hydrogen infrastructure to support um, hydrogen demand and what will it cost for all of the infrastructure from production delivery um, to end use. And so looking at each of those um, segments of the supply chain on the production side, you know, you can answer questions with Sarah models such as where should um, production facilities be placed, you know, if you have a number of candidate locations. Sarah will tell you where it would be optimal to uh, place production based on um, where demand is and you know what what prices for technology and feedstocks are. Another um, question it will an it'll answer is where does it make sense to place centralized production, um, and you know does it make sense to do centralized production or would it be better to do distributed pr production in some um, in some places? And then a third uh, question on the production side is you know we can start comparing different production technologies such as a lot electrolysis and auto thermal reforming with carbon capture and storage and see you know when would auto thermal or when would electrolysis become cost competitive with a technology such as auto thermal reforming or, or steam methane reforming and in what areas um in what locations would electrolysis become cost competitive um sooner than than other other regions on the delivery side, um, you know, Sarah will help us answer questions of, you know, what road network or pipeline right away should be utilized in order to connect your production facilities with your specified demand. Should the production um, in end use locations be connected by trucks or pipelines or a combination of both, depending on location? Um, and, you know, how does the optimal delivery pathway differ if you have different uh, delivery throughputs and delivery and different delivery distances. So that's another you know question that Sarah helps to answer um, with the optimization. And then finally on the end use side, 
um, what Sarah will help us answer is, you know, what is the cost for infrastructure for different demand types um, at different uh, levels of demand? Um, should the, you know, end use location be supplied with liquid or gaseous hydrogen? And, you know, that itself will impact the cost of infrastructure at the, the end use facility. And then what is the levelized cost of uh, dispensed hydrogen at a refueling station, demand location, or at other at a different uh, end use facility such as ammonia, um, or you know hydrogen for power generation or other um, other hydrogen demands. Um, and this slide is going to show sort of a you know process flow from production delivery to end use of you know possible technologies that you consider. Um, what uh, that Sarah will consider, but there's also, you know, more technologies that you can include as well, as long as you have cost data. Um, but I will start at the end because what you need to provide first into Sarah is um, demand locations, um, you know, an annual hydrogen demand um, for these demand locations. And how, basically how that demand will will evolve over time. And so in this case, I, you know, just put, you know, Two end use um, options here, mainly focused on um, refueling, but you can also look at other end uses as well that uh, Sarah can uh, consider. And then other inputs that you have to provide to Sarah is, you know, what production technologies you want to consider, you know, steam methane reforming, autothermal reforming, electrolysis pathways, gasification, and really any hydrogen production pathway you want to consider, um, Sarah, can, uh, Sarah can accommodate. And then on the delivery side, you know, typically we run Sarah with pipeline and gaseous and liquid trucking pathways, um, and it, it'll choose between which of those is least cost. Um, but you can you also can consider other delivery pathways as well if you want to transport it uh, via ammonia or um, you know a, a different uh, hydrogen carrier. You can model that as well with the with the, if you have the cost information for it. And then, you know, going deeper into basically all the inputs that go into the Sarah model, um, you can split those into, you know, four different ca categories. So you have your demand inputs to the model. So those are your demand locations, how you expect that demand to grow each year, and also, you know, what type of demand it is. And you can also have, um, you know, multiple demand types at a single node in the model. Um, on the production side, you're going to provide, you know, what possible locations do you want to allow Sarah to build production? And then you can consider, and then you look at basically providing Sarah any type of production pathway pathway that you want from, you know, electrolysis to autothermal reforming or, or other. And then there's the delivery inputs, which is the basically delivery network itself. So, you can provide Sarah basically the road network or right of way um, network, um, you know, at any granularity you want. Um, so it could be a national study, a regional study, and you know, you, you, know, you provide the, the road network that you want. Um, and again, that can be user defined. And then, you know, what delivery pathways you want to consider. And then last, you, you know, provide cost for basically all the technologies as well as um, so capital operating, fixed operating costs, um, and then also feedstock and material costs. So, so that's sort of the last tranche of, of major inputs to the model. And so those all get fed into the SARA model. And then, you know, you get a couple of outputs from the model. Um, I like this one specifically because I'm a visual person. So what you can, you can get out is an optimized infrastructure build out. So, you know, this is sort of a, a hypothetical case um, we're showing here where Basically, each image is tracking through time, um, showing basically how uh, basically the purple is the delivery throughput, and you can see how basically the purple lines get thicker um, because over time you're delivering more hydrogen over time, and sort of your blue is production facilities, so your production facilities grow over time to accommodate higher demand, and then also your demand nodes, which are the yellow, you don't see them too much in the first two, but over time from left to right, you know your demand grows. And so basically you, you get a picture of basically how the infrastructure uh, gets built out over time. And then in addition to that, you'll get some financial outlook. So, you know, you'll get a levelized cost of hydrogen delivered um, or basically a system-wide levelized cost of hydrogen. 
um, delivered to each of the demand locations, how that evolves over time. You'll also get marginal pricing at the uh, demand nodes and you know, you'll, each year you'll get a different marginal price so you can track sort of how the, the price of getting hydrogen to those demand nodes changes um, and, and basically how much it costs to get hydrogen to those demand nodes each year. And then you can also get sort of capital costs um, break down over time. And I also do want to mention, so this levelized cost of hydrogen can be broken down by capital operating uh, capital operating feedstock costs, but also can be broken down by sort of stage of delivery. So it could also be broken down by production delivery um, and, and dispensing. Um, this is sort of a, a cool slide. This is just basically showing a video of infrastructure being built out through time instead of you know showing the picture side by side. Um, so in this case, just another hypothetical case where basically we look at an annual um, sort of annual uh, change in infrastructure build out or an annual increase in infrastructure build out. Um, and so you see your, your links um, growing and you're getting more links connecting supply and demand over time and your production and demand nodes are growing over time. And then the right is showing just how capital costs are, are growing through time. Um, and that's again broken down by production delivery method um, and, and demand costs if you include those. Um, and then I know I mentioned at the at the beginning that we made a number of model updates. Um, these have uh, been update uh, all been updated in the last year or so since we've converted the the model over to the Julia programming uh, language. So I'll just uh, briefly go through some of the recent model updates that that we've uh, considered. And so one one of the you know I wouldn't call it a problem, but shortcomings shortcomings of Sarah is. You know, originally it was only able to consider one type of demand at a time. So if you wanted to do a case run, you'd have to do only refueling station demand and couldn't also consider, you know, ammonia or hydrogen for power generation or other types of demand. And so, you know, recently in the past year, we've updated Sarah and Julia so that you can consider these multiple types of hydrogen demands in a single in a single run. You know, another another thing that we are running into with Sarah is that because it um, employs a heuristics to consider the nonlinearity and in, in, with economies of scale, sometimes the model would have difficulty finding a global minimum solution or global maximum solution. Um, and so what we did to help resolve this is we included a starting point indicator for the heuristics. And this um, basically we can, as we you know run in initial uh, cases, we can change the starting point indicator, which basically specifies which um, costs to use for a technology, because um, you know those costs are dependent on economies of scale. Um, and so basically it goes through an iterative, iterative process to um, to converge to you know what technology costs it should assume. And that helps, um, and basically we can play with basically the starting point of what cost um, for the for the model to use, and that helps um, to give us you know more understanding of which solution is going to give us the the global minimum by changing that starting point. And then once we know what starting point gives us the the lowest cost, then we sort of stick with that starting point um, for the remainder of our our cases. Um, another uh, thing that you know Sarah originally could only uh, do was model centralized production, but we have updated Sarah so that you know you can do both on-site production cases and uh, centralized production cases in the same uh, case run. And then you know the next one that we have here is one of the things that Sarah would do is basically you could build any amount of supply with no in incremental cost so for example like if you if your demand really grew in one year say you're doing it with electrolysis cup from the grid um, basically if you build a whole ton of a, a whole bunch of electrolysis in a region in one year it would just use like one electricity price but it wouldn't say like oh well 
you know, we're taking up a lot more electricity in, in this grid system. So probably you're gonna have to turn on these higher cost generators and that's gonna increase the price um, of the electricity and then overall increase the price of production. So um, basically added in supply curves um, to consider that, you know, your electricity price, your feedstock prices will go up if you try to build out a ton of production in a region in a short amount of time. And then we have these specified um, by uh, EIA census region. Um, so you can have a different supply curve for each each uh, region. And primarily we focus on, on the US for our case runs. And then last one is sort of in the same vein as the supply curve, but looking at uh, the demand curve now. So, you know, originally Sarah would fulfill any specified amount of demand, um, no matter what price it would cost to get the hydrogen to that demand node or to dispense hydrogen at that demand node. And so what we did is we developed uh, or we implemented user-defined demand curves for each demand category. And so, you know, if it, it's going to cost a, like $30 per kilogram to get hydrogen to a refueling station node, it will just decide not, not to build that refueling station there um, because it knows, you know, it wouldn't be likely that um, you know, people would be buying hydrogen at that refueling station for $30 a kilogram. Um, so yeah, you can specify basically tranches of demand and, you know, how much hydrogen, uh, basically what price uh, you will supply hydrogen um, to those demand nodes. Um, yeah, so, sorry. So basically, you'll have tranches of demand. And if the price is really high, you won't fulfill much demand. But if the price gets lower, um, you'll specify a certain tranche of demand. And if the price is low enough, you can also fulfill even higher levels of uh, demand at specific nodes. Um, and so this slide will actually look familiar. Um, but what's interesting with Sarah and is another useful part of Sarah is that you don't have to use it just for hydrogen itself. You can use it for other uh, fuels or materials. So this is an example where you know, I'm showing you know, basically process flow for um, CO2 capture and utilization where like I'm basically where you had hydrogen production before you have CO2 capture from and I'm from any different, uh, you know, industrial facility or any other facility that has CO2 emissions, you can capture those emissions and, you know, Sarah can optimize sort of what delivery pathway to use to get it to um, the end use, which is either, you know, CO2 utilization or CO2 injection into the, into the subsurface. Um, and now I'll run through a case study where we actually uh, use Sarah. Um, and I will note that, you know, these are, preliminary results and they're they're more for you know explanatory purposes of how the model runs and are not you know representative of you know any government policy or anything so um, just to give you a sense of how the model how the model works in a real in a more realistic case and so I'll touch on this heavy load project where the goal was to determine the optimal placement and cost of hydrogen fueling stations to support long haul uh, fuel cell electric vehicles focusing on the year 2032 um, across the United States. And so this project had uh, three separate parts. Um, and so the first part was conducted by NREL and this part used the tempo model, which Alicia um, touched on briefly in the previous uh, webinar. And uh, that model predicts a long haul uh, heavy duty fuel cell electric vehicle adoption by the year 2032 at a geographic level. So uh, basically in every like sort of region throughout the United States, it'll give you sort of the adoption um, looking at the year of interest. And then that data is passed on to Berkeley Labs and they use their heavy load model, which is used to predict um, basically how much and where the hydrogen demand will be given the adoption from the tempo model. And what they do is use origin destination freight data along with those adoption adoption scenarios from the tempo model um, to say, you know, where where along the major corridors in the United States, we should ex will expect to see hydrogen demand and basically where uh, hydrogen refueling stations would need to be placed. And then um, our team at NREL, you know, takes that demand data from the heavy load model, and then we run it through the SARA model to estimate, you know, hydrogen infrastructure um, hydrogen infrastructure costs basically to get hydrogen from production 
to those refueling stations and sort of what's the total cost of the infrastructure going to be um, looking at the year 2032. And so our uh, image here on the left is looking at an output from the heavy load um, model, which is showing sort of the locations of demand for heavy duty fuel cell electric vehicles um, across the US and basically their location along the major corridors in the United States. And so in this scenario, we set the station spacing to about 300 miles. And it led to there being about 63 station locations. Um, and then there's a you know a couple of additional stations placed in major major demand areas and major cities such as LA, San Francisco, um, and others. Um, we set it at 300 miles in this initial case based on you know what the range of the long haul fuel cell electric vehicles are today, which is about 400 miles. So that gets us to about 25% uh, stay of charge at refueling. But we also did some sensitivities looking at um, closer spacing. Um, so 200 mile station, station spacing we also looked at. Um, and again, we're focusing on basically the hydrogen demand that we expect in 2032 with the fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, long haul fuel cell electric vehicles on the road. Um, and when I talk about long haul, I mean, I guess I'm talking about class six through eight fuel cell electric vehicles that, you know, take on, uh, you know, long haul that are that are doing long haul trips. And in this data uh, that we're using for this study, about 1% of the class six through eight vehicles um, are fuel cell electric in 2032. Um, and then 80% of those um, fuel cell electric vehicles are, are class eight trucks that are, you know, taking these long haul, long haul trips. Um, for the delivery pathways that we're considering to get hydrogen from production to the demand locations, uh, we considered gaseous and, and liquid trucking as the options. And then we use feedstock prices based on the EIA and their annual energy outlook, uh, most, re most recent annual energy outlook. And then, you know, for this preliminary case, we did a 50% station utilization rate. Um, for production technologies that we're going to allow in Sarah, we we just focused on grid electrolysis, and we basically allowed for grid electrolysis to be placed at any location where you know the refueling stations are all, are also going to be located based on uh, you know the purple dots in in this figure, and then for the cost for the electrolysis, we based it off of you know currently published DOE um, and NREL um, NREL estimates. Um, a little bit deeper into the feedstock and energy prices. Um, you know, and these are pulled from the annual annual energy outlook from EIA. And um, the granularity of Sarah can be, you know, it has some flexibility to it. You know, most of the runs we do, we just split up the the feedstocks by these EIA regions, so nine nine EIA regions. Um, but you have some flexibility to you know, make that more granular. You could do it at state level if you have the electricity price and natural gas price data for those. Um, you could even do it at, you know, even more granular um, interstate level um, if you have the data and basically how the uh, prices evolve over time. Um, but for this case study, we just broke it down into these nine EIA regions. Um, and I think what I'll note here is you can Notice that for the electricity price, the cheapest region is um, in the southeast, basically Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky are, and that'll be you know uh, useful information to know on this next slide here, because um, this next slide is getting into some Sarah results um, from this specific case. So our image on the left is looking at the infrastructure buildout that we get from the Sarah model um, when we run it. You, assuming, you know, grid electrolysis production as the only production option, um, you know, our refueling station demand locations, and then either gas, gas or liquid trucking. And so I think the first thing I got, I want you to notice in this slide is, you know, the green represents the production. What we see is the green is mostly centered in this Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky region, which, you know, sort of makes sense uh, when we think about uh, where the electricity prices were cheapest, which was in that region, which was in this region. And so, you know, the Sarah model saw that it would be 
cheapest to produce hydrogen from grid electrolysis in this region because of the low electricity prices and then deliver it to you know um, the other refueling stations that are outside of that region. Um, another thing to note here is um, the yellow indicates a liquid hydrogen trucking links. And the reason why it ends up choosing liquid hydrogen trucking over gaseous trucking is primarily due to the size of the, the demand at the refueling stations. Most of the demand is over three, four tons uh, per day at each of these refueling stations. And when you have larger demands, liquid trucking becomes more favorable um, than gaseous tube trailer uh, transport. And then I think the last thing I want you to know is there's some you know, interplay between delivering it further versus building you know, a smaller production facility like here and delivering it like a, sh a shorter distance. So you know, the model could have easily made this production facility a little bit bigger and delivered hydrogen all the way to these refueling stations in Washington, Oregon. Um, but there was a trade-off of you know, delivering it that extra distance versus just building a little bit smaller production facility closer by and then you know, having a short uh, delivery um, to these refueling stations in Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, and last thing I want to note here is that you see that it, it built it in Idaho rather than building it, you know, in like Oregon or Washington because the electricity price was just a little bit cheaper in high, in Idaho than in the in this Pacific uh, region. And then on the right uh, figure you see here is looking at the marginal costs of di dispensing hydrogen at the refuel at the refueling station nodes. And so, you know, this these prices give you sort of a sense of, you know, what the cost would be to dispense hydrogen at each of the refueling station locations. And, you know, the main thing to note here is as you get further away from, you know, a production facility, like the production facility here at the top of Kentucky, so your, your marginal price is 449, but then as you say, get farther away going east, all the way up here, your price gets larger to 501. Um, and sort of gets larger as you go along the way to get to this uh, node all the way in the top northeast part of the country. And then you, oops, my bad. Then you also can get a system levelized uh, cost of dispense hydrogen as well for for that year. Um, and then you know this case study we only ran it, the model for one year, but you know if you ran it for many years, you would be able to see how this infrastructure build up changes over time and how these marginal prices change over time. And then how the system levelized cost would change over time as well. Um, and this is just the last SER output. This is a different case study, but mo mainly I wanted to focus on the table on the right to show you other outputs from the SER model. So you can, you know, get a breakdown of uh, production capacity by, you know, these EIA regions, or you can get the production capacity at each individual node in the model. You know, you can also get the capex breakdown by by region. And then you can also get, you know, electricity requirement, both for, you know, the PEM electrolysis production, but also any electricity required at, you know, refueling stations um, or other end use facilities. And that, you know, that those inputs can be fed into, you know, a grid capacity expansion model as well as inputs. Um, and so there's, you know, definitely some links between this model and, and other uh, planning models as well. Um, finally, last couple of slides here, I'll just run, you know, why SARA is important today and, you know, where we think it'll grow and be used in uh, coming up here. And so, you know, there really isn't any, uh, many tools similar to SARA on the market today. There is one other uh, tool that's fairly similar to SARA that, you know, optimizes hydrogen infrastructure build out, and that's the Howdy, mile, Howdy um, model by UT Austin. Um, the main differences that I've seen in the model, I haven't done too much of a deep dive, but the main difference I see is that Sarah, you know, has some more flexibility in terms of being able to model the nonlinearity in, in costs to consider economies of scale. Um, and then Sarah also has the ability to model, you know, storage technologies such as salt cavern storage and can also, you know, get down to more temporal granularity looking at like a monthly or seasonal level to, you know, look at how, you know, storage um, could evolve um, or basically how, you know, salt cavern storage could be utilized um, over time as well, um, which doesn't um, seem to be a capability in Howdy at this moment. Um, another, you know, 
highly important thing about Sarah is that, you know, we have funding to support hydro the hydrogen hub teams and their infrastructure planning. We're, you know, expected to do a lot of work um, as these hubs plan out um, you know, where to build um, infrastructure and, you know, what demands that they are looking to satisfy. And so we're starting to look at where is optimal to put these uh, production facilities and how to connect uh, supply with demand will be a big part of these uh, Department of Energy hydrogen hubs. And sort of in a similar vein, the Office of Clean em Energy Demonstrations um, has um, some funding. Um, and they're, you know, they're the ones making the investment decisions on the hydrogen hubs. And, you know, we'll be using SARA for them as well to help them decide, again, you know, where, you know, production facilities um, should be placed to, to meet demands that they're expecting for hydrogen in, in these hydrogen hubs. And then I touched on on this one uh, briefly, but you know this model and can be you know can inform can also be connected with many other hydrogen infrastructure tools at NREL. You know grid electricity expansion, you know can provide finer detail on you know costs uh, hydrogen cost information that other tools um, need um, to like compare hydrogen versus other materials or and fuels. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, use within the NREL system um, for this tool um, and, you know, connecting it to other, other tools. And sort of a similar thing here, not just, you know, doesn't need to just be connected with NREL tools, but also, you know, tools across uh, DOE, such as their GCAM and, and NEMS tool. And another um, interesting, interesting, cool thing about SARA is that, you know, anybody can actually use the, the SARA model now. It has become publicly available. We have we have the source code closed, but um, we can provide an executable version of the model um, and you can develop your own test cases um, to run the model. Um, we, we would just need to you know, get in contact with you and uh, get you guys to uh, a licensing agreement to be able to use the executable. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, if that's something any of you all want to consider um, you know, using this model, um, yeah, please reach out to me. And then uh, last slide here, I just want to touch on some of the limitations of, of the SARA model and, you know, how we can address some of these limitations. Um, so, you know, one limitation, and in, in this one, I wouldn't quite even call a limitation, just sort of, you know, what the model should be used for. So it's, it's basically, you know, a, a capacity expansion model for hydrogen infrastructure. And so you want to be using it over, over long time windows of, of multiple years. Um, and so, you know, you might, do sort of shorter term, um, you know, operations type of uh, techno-economic work, basically looking at, you know, looking at like a behind the meter storage type system where you're, you're, you know, you're putting hydrogen into storage and out of storage, um, you know, basically looking over a year, basically a 8, 7, 60, you know, hours looking at one year optimization. That's not what this model is, but what you can do is connect sort of results from, you know, sort of the operations TEA model. Um, you can connect that to Sarah and tell tell Sarah what the cost is for that. Um, and then, you know, where where basically what location that is and Sarah, you know, you can have Sarah build out, um, you know, something that is more, uh, more of a complex um, um, production facility that, you know, couples, you know, could be renewables coupled with storage, um, some those can be represented in SARA. Um, you know, another limitation is that it currently only minimizes over cost. And we talked on this one a little bit. We did include um, demand curve, demand curves that help us, you know, model it more as a, uh, a demand benefit instead of, you know, minimizing costs. But we are also planning to add more capabilities to, minim to minimize externalities such as emissions, and then also, you know, try to maximize like GDP growth in regions that we're using the SARA model and then increase jobs um, in the regions where we're using the SARA model. Um, and then this third one here, I, I sort of touched on already, you know, it's not optimizing equipment operations for shorter time periods, you know, looking at minutes, hours, or daily level, but, you know, you can incorporate results from those models into the inputs of SARA so that it could build out, um, you know, that infrastructure in SARA where, where, you know, where you'd want it to be placed. And then finally, this is also sort of related um, to the last one uh, that I just talked about is that, 
you know, electrolysis coupled with, with renewables is not currently represented. You know, we typically model grid grid electrolysis in Sarah right now. Um, and we're going to do some work here um, and have plans to, you know, increase the geographic granularity of, you know, the feedstock costs so that you can have more detail and have the flexibility to start to model some more behind the meter renewables coupled uh, electrolysis systems. And so that's, you know, in the works in the future. Um, with that, you know, I'll pass it back to Danielle. Thank you for listening. And yeah, I'll take your guys' questions. Thanks so much, Justin. Uh, really great. And there are a lot of compliment, complimentary comments in there saying they loved your graphics. So, um, but over to the technical questions. Uh, obviously, a lot of the examples that you've shared are from the US, but we have a very international audience here. Um, so we're interested in hearing if you can speak on how this could be applied in other countries. I know you've touched on that a little bit, a bit but if you could expand on that a bit. Right. So yeah, this this model can definitely be applied um, to other countries. It's the the one thing like I think in terms of like the technologies themselves, like the capital and fixed costs, like those I don't think will be much different. So in terms of those costs, like we have you know cost information for that, so there wouldn't really be any changes there. It'd be more about building the you know road network or delivery network to get um, hydrogen from your production to your demand locations, and then. Um, getting the right feedstock costs so, um, and how that sort of varies by region. So those would probably be the two lists um, to start thinking about it, um, you know, at a different, in a different uh, region other than, other than the U.S. So, yeah. Right. Thank you. And I guess along those lines and related to the next question, um, there's a lot of interest in, in learning how to use this model. You know, are there any user manuals, trainings, uh, videos mm -hmm. that, that we could share that would help them? And, you know, if there were an interested party or project, um, you know, what would be kind of the, the learning curve to, to implement this model? Right. Yeah. So we have some documentation that we've put together over the past year, and we have that stored on a GitHub page. And we, we have a um, like a short term license that we're starting to do. We just started doing this recently. So if people are interested in you know, being able to access that GitHub page and be able to run test cases like we have a simple test case that, you know, you don't really even have to do anything. You could just hit run and it'll run for you and then you can start to look at the output file. So we do have that available. So um, I don't know if it would be good for me to put my email in the chat or if you have my email, you can send it to people because if you yeah get in contact with me, we have a, you know, can get a license set up for people just to have a short term access to see how see how it works. And that's great. Again, there's there's documentation there on all the inputs and outputs that you need for the model. So, um, yeah, we have that there for for people that are interested. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. If you don't mind putting your email in the chat, if you're you OK yeah. with that, that would be great. <clears throat> yeah. And also, if you can comment a bit in terms of at what part of the process in planning would you recommend using this tool? So as you know, governments, for example, are, are starting to think about infrastructure planning um, or when you have specific fleets that you're looking at or all of all of the above, if you can comment a bit on that. Yeah. Sent my uh, email in the chat. I think everybody sees that. Um, yes. But yeah. OK, cool. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think ideally, um, because because it's a capacity expansion model, you want to run it. Typically, we'd like to run it from, you know, say today and run it at an annual level all the way to 2050. So it'd be like a, you know, I don't know, like, yeah, basically 2030, like 20 to 30 year, like planning, like sort of long-term planning instead of more like one or two year, you know, what should we build out? Um, we actually, um, so this case study that we ran, it is possible to do these shorter time window ones. So we we do have the capability of running just like one year at a time to say like, okay, you know, what would be the optimal build out in this one specific year? But one of the limitations of that is that you don't really know what the infrastructure build out was to get there. And, you know, basically the planning could change over time. And so this is just giving you like, okay, one snapshot, one year. This is what we would like to be. If if we only are looking at this one specific year, this is how we would want production to be placed and how we would want everything delivered. But if you can look over it, look at it over multiple years, you can see how the model will sort of plan infrastructure build out over time. Um, so that gives you a sense like, okay, maybe the first 
five years, we should focus on this. And then it, it basically can give you more you know, flexibility in how things should be built out over time rather than just saying, okay, we want it to look like this, but not really knowing how you should get there. Right. And who would you say are your typical users of this model? Would it be kind of government, city planners, fleet operators? If you can comment a bit on who this model has been most useful for. Yeah, so we have used this model um, for a lot of uh, DOE offices. So we we use it for HFTO. They have, you know, their sort of liftoff reports and, and sort of roadmaps for how they want infrastructure to be built. So that's HFTO roadmap hydrogen fuel cell technology office, which is part of DOE. Um, so primarily we use it for them, but we've also worked with the Environmental Protection Agency um, as they're sort of planning how, um, you know, vehicle adoption, vehicle adoption will look and how they expect fuel cell electric vehicles to, to grow. So we use it for them to sort of plan out. Um, and I guess also for them, look at, look at like how, you know, the cost of the infrastructure will evolve over time. Um, and then we also have had some interest from other research institutes um, lately, some um, auto auto um, manufacturing companies that are you know interested in looking planning you know where um, where production facilities you know are today and where it can be placed in the future, um, so that they can sort of get a sense of siting their you know like refueling stations and stuff like that. So get a sense of like what the major corridors that will, will be developed will be. So those are, yeah, some of the, the users that we've had. Great. And you mentioned HFTO. There was a question in there regarding who are the main contacts uh, with TOE or with the government, uh, U.S. government. So we put that info in there as well um, and, and the general contact info for HFTO if you'd like to reach out to them. Um, great. I think we have a couple technical questions here as well. Is Sarah a linear programming model? How non-linearities are interested? How are nonlinearities introduced, uh, leading to local uh, minima? An elaboration or clarification would be helpful on that. Yeah, so that one, I'm not. I don't develop the models, so I'm I'm not that in the weeds. But I'll try my best at it. So <laughs> it is a it is a linear program right now, but it can handle nonlinearities by taking advantage of a of heuristics, which is basically, um, you know, you provide say you want to build like an autothermal reformer, you provide a cost information for autothermal reformer at different capacities. And there's some nonlinearity in, in, in that. So, you know, usually it has a scaling factor of like 0.6, but you'll just start at, you know, one of the capacities and provide it that cost. And then it'll optimize, uh, you do linear optimization using that cost. And then it'll say, okay, I built out and autothermal reforming is this, that's this size. I'm going to run it again and look in those input files for this, for this capacity, that whatever's closest to that capacity that it ended up building out in the first run and use that cost. And then I'll optimize it again. And then it'll, you know, compare the two sort of uh, cost outputs from the two. And then it'll keep doing that until it converges to, you know, a solution that's consistent where it's not, not changing anymore. So, yeah. So hopefully, that explained it, but yeah, it's linear, but it it sort of optimizes it multiple times and then gets to, a, then it converges to to the answer. Great, thank you. And obviously if, if um, that particular person would like any more info on that, feel free to reach out to, to Justin sure. directly. Um, yeah. And then the last sort of more technical question, what will the interaction or uh, iteration maybe frequency be between model simulation and taking action on those insights? Hmm. I don't know if I quite understand that one. So I guess my, maybe my interpretation of that would be, um, you know, what, how do you respond to the results from this? And if you have kind of an iterative approach, so do you model okay. yep. and then from that kind of iterate on the model to then uh, pull the insights in and, and, and apply that, or what does that process look like? Yeah. So typically um, when we meet with, you know, client, They'll have, you know, generally they they don't have like, you know, super detailed understanding of how the model operates. So they give us sort of broad parameters that they want to look at. Like we want to see this, you know, production technology or this delivery technology included because um, that's what we see is going to be built out. So, you know, we'll do multiple iterations of it and basically do sensitivities where, 
you know, we'll try including three different production technologies and let it choose between those. Or we'll, you know, if they want to look at one where it's, you know, just focused on one production technology, one delivery technology or whatever. So basically the client sort of gives us, um, you know, their guidelines or suggestions on what they'd like to see in the model. And we'll run cases with that, but then we'll also run cases like, okay, well, we'll feed it everything, all the production delivery technologies that it has and see what, see it, see what happens and output there. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do sensitivity analysis. Um, and we'll also, you know, we can even run like different electricity pricing scenarios as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and natural gas basically feedstock pricing scenarios as well. So we've definitely done a lot of cases, um, where, you know, yeah, we, we, it's more of an iterative, uh, sensitivity mm -hmm. process. And actually that, that leads to a good point too, is that, um, uh, we're, we're also trying to get funding to do some, uh, basically to get error bounds on the analysis. So when we run it, um, you know, basically money, run it multiple times, so, something similar to a Monte, Car Monte Carlo simulation where you can have sort of error bounds on, on your results and look at a couple different um, near optimal um, scenarios or basically how um, the infrastructure build out changes if you change something just very slightly. So um, yeah, we're, we're going to do more work in that area as well. Great, really exciting. Um, so Brian, I just want to make sure we did answer your question uh, correctly. If you have anything to add, please feel free to, to add it as well um, in the Q&A. And there was one other more general question that Alicia uh, responded to, but I thought it would be good to share. How do we promote hydrogen in the transport sector? And when we say we, I, I assume uh, that they're referring to the US government. Um, but Alicia had a response. I don't know if Alicia, if you wanted to elaborate on that and, and also Justin and Evan, if you had anything to add. I'm having trouble with my camera. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just indicated, I mean, what we're doing in the US, you know, if, if you're looking for policy ideas, um, what we're doing is currently the, the uh, if Inflation Reduction Act has incentives for vehicle purchases um, and the, which, you know, as I showed, will actually accelerate kind of the, the parity point so that, that, you know, it becomes more cost effective for more, uh, more consumers earlier. Um, but also then there are incentives for um, for the hydrogen production itself. I, I'm no, I've never dug into those. Um, somebody else here might be able to elaborate on what those look like, but basically trying to, you know, incentivize and bring down the price of, of the hydrogen production as well. And then finally, uh, Justin mentioned the hydrogen hubs. Um, again, not my area of expertise, but I think, you know, trying to get, 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 um, identify where and build out uh, the hydrogen infrastructure. Um, and I, I assume we're identifying, well, it's not just transportation related, right? So that's multiple uses. Justin, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I think uh, Alicia talked on like the main talking points so that, yeah, the US government has done a lot of work with both the Inflation Reduction Act um, and the infrastructure bill that the infrastructure bill has the hydrogen hubs in there. And so, yeah, there's, I think they decided on seven hydrogen hubs and there's like close to a billion dollars being allocated for each of those hubs to, you know, plan and, you know, invest in hydrogen infrastructure there. I think mainly on the, um, that on the, on the production side that that money's going to go towards building uh, hydrogen production. And then, you know, on a similar vein, the inflation reduction ha act has, you know, the 45 V tax credit, um, which is, you know, credit on um, producing hydrogen, um, where, you know, if it's lower emission hydrogen production, you get a higher uh, tax credit and that, you know, it's going to help to, you know, drive down the price and, you know, getting and help to lower um, the levelized or the, the cost of dispensing hydrogen at refueling stations in the future and help and uh, hopefully help to jumpstart, um, you know, more of demand growth in, in the U.S., especially in the, in the trucking space. And I think there might also be some goals to get more uh, policy out there on the end use side for refueling stations and, sh and such. I know they have that in California. Um, they have their LCFS um, for uh, like hydrogen refueling stations, which get some credits as well. Um, and so, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll see too um, um, what comes out on that front as well. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think we're trying to address, you know, the cost issues for both the vehicle and the fuel, the availability of the infrastructure. But then also um, we have a lot of demonstration projects that are funded by DOE and by uh, California uh, demonstrations on both the vehicle side and on the uh, on the infrastructure because reliability of both of them, of course, is, a, is an extremely important uh, aspect. And, and the idea here is that, you know, kind of work out all those early technology kinks so that we can, you know, get to that point where um, the consumers have confidence in both the vehicles and the infrastructure. Right. That's that's wonderful. And yeah, I think you can get a lot of information on all of the programs that were mentioned. Um, if you would like more information and you can't find it, please feel free to reach out to us and we can help you um, find that. I think there's a lot of information on the IRA and the production tax credit. Um, and really that has had a huge impact on unmobilizing investment in hydrogen projects. Um, certainly in the U.S. So uh, we also do a lot of work with international governments and and sort of sharing the lessons learned from the IRA program and the PTC uh, production tax credit, just, um, you know, so that other governments can also look at their respective incentives and programs to to promote hydrogen in, in their countries. So I don't see any other questions. Just want to give everybody one last opportunity to ask our panelists any of your either technical or regulatory um, you know, any any questions are welcome, even if it's related to the first presentations. If not, I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide, which thank you um, is kind of an, an overview of all of these tools. So I know you know this is our sixth webinar in the series. Um, again, similar to today's format, we've always looked at kind of having a combination of a high level technical presentation and then a presentation on the application of the different national lab tools. So this is sort of a big picture overview of all the tools that we have available. We did spend some time on H2A and Rodeo in previous webinars. Uh, we touched on Sarah today and you can kind of see in this pyramid how they all sort of fit together. Um, and that's really important because Ultimately, we want to make sure that that you guys are aware of all these different tools at different stages of of and processes of your hydrogen project development um, or hydrogen market development, depending on you know if you're kind of more government or private sector. Um, but just wanted to reiterate that these tools are open source; they're free, um, and and certainly there's plenty of information uh, that you can access in terms of webinars, in terms of tutorials, uh, manuals, links to more information uh, and case studies as well related to these. So um, what we're going to be doing in our next webinar and the last webinar of this series is trying to bring all of this together. And it's been, you know, amazing information. And we've really um, done a lot of deep dives, you know, into the individual tools and their applications and the different considerations uh, to hydrogen market development. Uh, but we're really going to try and apply this in a very specific case study, um, which if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll be using the H2 FAST tool. Um, this is just a, a, a hypothetical example of, of how the H2 FAST tool can uh, run a techno-economic analysis of a hydrogen project, in this case, a, a green ammonia project derived from renewable powered hydrogen, um, and, and really just looking at, you know, what are the different cost considerations? What are the different, um, inputs that you can kind of vary and and sort of changing uh, the project assumptions so that you can really see how that impacts the overall model for for your hydrogen project so in this case you know we've looked at the capital cost the operating cost the incentives so like the production tax credit or others that you might have in your country different financing options so you might have access to preferential loans or preferential interest rates, um, all of that kind of going into different scenarios. You know, what about if our off taker is in Korea or, you know, in 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 um, Japan or even in Europe and our production sources in in South America, for example. And so how does that change uh, the overall economics of this project? You know, we have transport considerations, we have distribution considerations, delivery considerations. Um, all of that really plays into the, the economic consideration and results. Of, of a specific project. And so that's what we're going to be diving into during our next and last webinar. And we're going to be drawing from all of the previous webinars. So we're going to be talking about 
you know, the emissions associated with the project. We're going to be talking about the social and the environmental implications. Um, we're going to be talking about the infrastructure requirements or considerations. So, um, you know, really excited to, to have you guys continue uh, joining us uh, in this webinar series and really excited to be able to share some more concrete uh, case study examples with you in the next one. Go to the next slide, please. So during that process, and this is one of the exercises that we'll be diving into uh, during the next webinar, we'll be looking at a SWOT analysis. Uh, so I'm sure you guys are all aware of a, of a typical SWOT analysis for, for any project, but it looks at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats for a project. Um, and these are just some examples of the types of considerations or questions that you might ask during that process. Um, so really, you know, specific to a project, uh, looking at do we have strong renewable energy resources here? Do we have, a, you know, a good off taker, a strong off taker with a good credit record? Um, do we have local off takers or do we have to export and consider all of those transport and distribution costs? Um, you know, what are the main opportunities? Uh, do we have kind of agricultural hubs in the area clusters that, that could use green ammonia? Um, if that's the specific example that we're going to dive into. Um, you can look at the weaknesses, like does this particular technology have a low technology readiness level, in which case, you know, it's harder to get financing as well from banks if they're not as aware of this technology or it has less of a history of success. Um, you might also want to look at factors like the labor force. Do we have a good trained labor force? you know, in this particular project area that can support the development of this project. Um, you know, and kind of going into regulatory framework, do we have an existing regulatory framework where, you know, we actually have everything in place, enabling conditions in place to allow us to develop this project, or are we going to run into roadblocks? Um, you know, and threats, do we have a community that's not supportive of this project? Are we competing with water resources? Um, are we going to have impacts on, on local biodiversity? You know, all of these, all of these questions that we need to go through. And there's, there's a lot up here, but there's so many more. And it, it's very specific to your site, it's specific to your project, it's specific to your region, it's specific to your government. Um, so so all of these are, are extremely important considerations that need to be taken into account when, when moving forward with the project. So we're really going to dive into this again during our next webinar um, and, and also just pulling from all of these amazing previous webinars that we've had. So today's webinar on, on SARA um, and considerations for utilization in the transport sector, that will be quite relevant as well as one of the possible low markets uh, that we consider as off takers for hydrogen production. So we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to remind you, I know we presented this in our first webinar, but this is the, our uh, hydrogen considerations tree, which is a structured approach to looking at different hydrogen or hydrogen derivative projects um, and really just helping you to you know, ask the right questions to, to kind of look at, are we considering all of the factors that may make this project a success or or the opposite, may prevent this project from being developed. And so in this hydrogen considerations tree, we go through you know, all of these major considerations from end use applications, you know, who's going to be using this? How are they going to be using this? Do we have a local market? Um, do we have local clusters? And then going into, you know, how are we going to produce this? Do we have strong renewable energy resources here? Do we have the feedstock that we need? Um, are we able to achieve the low emission hydrogen that we're aiming for to be able to access foreign markets, uh, if that is your objective for the project? Um, what infrastructure do we have in place? You know, do we have a port if we are going to export? Or do we have, you know, transport infrastructure if, if it's going to be regional, but you still have to transport that hydrogen in all of the different ways that we discussed today? Um, do you have storage? Do you have on-site storage? Do you need above ground storage, underground storage? Um, so all of those are, are very important in, in considering for the final techno-economic analysis of these projects. Um, and on the cost and economic viability, again, we need to look at, you know, what are our CapEx? What are our OpEx costs? Do we have an existing market? Are we assuming there's a market, but we haven't yet confirmed that? Um, do we have availability of the technology? Do we have, you know, issues with, um, with, with actually accessing that technology? Is this a low TRL, um, which could also cause problems as well and increase the cost and increase our financing? Um, so all of those are major economic considerations. And then we got into the environmental and social 
legal considerations, which are extremely important for any project, not just hydrogen projects. So looking at community acceptance, you know, how we engage the community. Are we are we supporting the community with workforce development opportunities? Or are, you know, is the community against this project for whatever reason? Is, is that going to be a major barrier? Um, are we using a desalinization plant? And if so, have we considered the environmental implications of discharging the brine? Um, you know, are we competing with water resources? These are all very important. Obviously, there's many benefits to using hydrogen, um, you know, clean hydrogen. And so, so we want to consider both the pros and the cons of, of those environmental considerations. And then on the policy side, do we have a regulatory framework in place? Do we have all of the the, the technical considerations, the certification requirements? Um, do we have the safety considerations and protocols in place? Do we have a hydrogen law? Do we need a hydrogen law? Um, you know, all of these things are, are very important uh, to ensure that you're not going to get a major barrier when you've already invested quite a bit in this project. So really understanding the regulatory framework for the entire process of development uh, through distribution and export. So all of that is uh, wrapped into the materials that we've covered during this webinar series. Um, and in this last exercise, uh, kind of number eight here, consideration street exercises, that's really what we're going to be focusing on in, in this last webinar again. So we're going to be looking at a specific case study of a, hyd a renewable powered electrolysis hydrogen and then uh, subsequently green ammonia project, uh, green ammonia, which could be used for agricultural applications. Um, but then also the hydrogen can be used. And in the case that a desalinization plant is used, you might have other uh, secondary benefits for the community. So lots of components of, of this project that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be discussing the SWOT analysis, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats, um, and all of the considerations, the technical considerations, such as infrastructure and infrastructure planning, as we covered today, different end use if it's going to be for agriculture, if it's going to be for transport, if it's going to be for power generation, um, you know, and, and kind of looking at what are the specific opportunities in that particular region, looking at clusters versus export. Um, so really an exciting synthesis of, of all of the information that you guys have gained over, over the last six webinars. So we'll go on to the next slide. Okay. So on this slide, you can go ahead and um, download both the hydrogen considerations tree deck that I was just referring to, and we also have a fact sheet on that. Uh, for those of you that are planning or participating in the next webinar, it would be great if you wanted to, and if you have time to take a look at those in preparation for the next webinar, where we're really going to be doing a deep dive into all of the considerations categories that so again, here are the QR codes to download those. They're just good references to have in general. And obviously, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to, to reach out to me or any of the speakers that, that we had in the webinar today or any of the previous webinars as well. So with that, we're going to close off today's webinar, um, unless if there were any other questions, and it, it looks like uh, there is one question. Uh, has there been any timeline produced or shared regarding the implementation of infrastructure developments? So that's going back to our speakers. I don't know if any of you want to respond to that last question. Sorry, can you repeat it again? Yeah, have there been any have has there been a timeline produced or shared regarding the implementation of infrastructure developments? So I that's in reference to in the U.S., I would assume? Yeah, I don't think there's any set date. I think they're like they're trying to finalize the Inflation Reduction Act incentives over the next couple of months, I think. And then I think same thing with the hydrogen hubs. They're um, they're hoping to have, I think that, you know, have some more plans, set plans in place over the next several months. But I, there's no like set set uh, date. Okay. Thanks very much. And if there aren't any other questions, I don't see any additional ones. Um, just want to thank everybody for your participation, your great questions. Uh, Sophie has shared the link for the next webinar. You can also uh, access that in this QR code. Um, and we'll have a survey as well that's going to pop up at the end of this webinar. So I know we have two minutes left. If you would be so kind as to uh, 
contribute your comments in the survey, uh, give us feedback on the webinar. We always want to know how we can improve it. Uh, we have one webinar left, so we want to make sure that's as useful as possible for you. So any feedback you can provide on that as well would be well received. And with that, thanks everyone. Thanks so much to our presenters, Evan, Alicia, Justin, really great webinar today, and we will see you next time. Thanks everyone. Have a great day or evening. Thank you. Thanks.